I couldn't be more delighted to introduce to you my friend, the amazing Carl McCullman. He's our keynote speaker for our Christian Mystic Summit. And he's, he's just a beautiful human being. He's a beautiful writer, spiritual director, retreat leader. He's an internationally known speaker and teacher on mystical spirituality and contemplative living. Carl brings such a profound mind and heart to explaining the relationships and distinctions between the world's mystical traditions and Christian contemplation. He sees the, the elegance and the simplicity of Christian mysticism as an, a very integral part of the, the larger conversation that the Christian community is beginning to have about reclaiming this ancient contemplative tradition within an inner spiritual understanding. So Carl is the author of many important books. Two of my favorites are right here. His book, The Eternal Heart, The Mystical Path to a Joyful Life. And then I guess you could say this is the old big book of Christian mysticism, a, a real joy to read. Um, uh, and even if you've read that, um, you'll want to um, enjoy his new big book of Christian mysticism uh, that, as Keith mentioned, is coming out to the public in August. Um, the new big book of Christian mysticism is significantly revised and expanded. So again, even if you've already read the first edition, I, I really think you'll want to read the new version as well. I know I will. I also want to highly recommend real quickly Carl's website and blog, which you can find at anamcara.com. That's A-N-A-M C-H-A-R-A, anamkara.com. It's just a really rich source of his inspiring and informative writings. Do take a look at that. So Carl is going to be talking with us today about going deep and wide, how, integrating Christian mystical practice with inner spiritual exploration. So everyone, please join me in warmly welcoming Carl McComan. Carl, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jana and Keith, and, and all of you for, um, for the generosity of your presence and your willingness to share this time uh, with me, with us, as we, um, as we seek to be attentive to the mysteries together. Uh, I do want to share one thing from the book before I get started with our opening meditation. So, you know, it was a tremendous gift to be able to do the second edition of this book. And as I sat down to work on it about a year ago now, I, I really was kind of puzzled with how did I want to rewrite the introduction? You know, because I, I, I know myself, I'll walk into bookstores and I'll pick up a book and I'll open it up and I'll read the first page. And for whatever reason, I may not buy the book. Maybe I don't have enough money. Maybe I already have 12 books in my shopping cart, or it just didn't grab me for whatever reason. So I really was trying to think about the person for whom the first page of this book may be the totality of their experience. And I wanted to be sure to give that person a gift, as well as the person who buys it and takes it home and reads it from cover to cover. And so after considerable prayer and meditation, and, and hopefully a little bit of grace. The first sentence of the book, what I settled on was this. Love is real, God is love, and God dwells in your heart. And the other 402 pages is basically just a footnote to that. That's, that's the new big book in Christian mysticism in a nutshell. And, um, and so I really hope that we can hold that in our hearts tonight. And, and if you want, you know, some like biblical basis for that, look no further than Romans chapter five, verse five. Love is real. God is love. And God dwells in our hearts. So I invite you to hold that as I share first a little bit of my story and then a few thoughts 
on this interesting question of Christian mysticism and inner spirituality. So I want to mention two dates in my life that are very formative, and they both took place in February during my childhood, but they were 13 years apart. And the first one, and there may be a few people on this call who will remember, it was quite the date. I don't think Keith is old enough to remember. It was February 9th, 1964. And if you were there, and I was just a little taught, but if you were there, you probably tuned in to Ed Sullivan to watch the Beatles on their first, I see Jana Waven, yes, uh, on their first of, of several appearances on, on the Ed Sullivan show. But of course, that was the launch of what we called the British Invasion. So why was that date so important? Well, let me get back to that, but I'll talk about the second one, which was February 5th, almost to the day, but 1977, 13 years later. Now I'm 16 years old. And if you've read my book, Unteachable Lessons, you know where I'm going with this one. Is that I was at a Lutheran church camp, high school kids church camp, and during the communion service on Saturday night, everything melted and was filled with light. And I can't explain that. I don't know if I just had a serotonin rush. Well, I probably did have a serotonin rush. The question is, what do you make of the serotonin rush? And what I made of it then, and what still rings true for me, is that it was a moment of grace where I was able to look through the window into that divine presence in my heart. And um, was that, that that line from Robert Frost, I took the road less traveled and it's made all the difference. Both of those dates have made all the difference in my life. So um, I, I am in love with Jesus. I'm just blissfully, deliriously, hopelessly, romantically, erotically in the fullest sense of the word mystically in love with Jesus. I'm in love with Jesus's teachings. I'm in love with the story. I'm in love with the tradition. I argue like I'll get out with the institution. That's another story. We'll just set that aside for right now. But I'm in love with Jesus. And that night in 1977 was our amazing first date. But I'm also in love with rock and roll, and I'm in love with the Beatles. And the reason why that night on Ed Sullivan is so important, because four years later, the Beatles went to India. Now, they weren't the first to go to India. In fact, Ram Das went to India the year before. Many followed them. But there was something cataclysmic about the Beatles going to India. They came back. George Harrison certainly was a changed person, and it probably affected the others as well. And we all know that in 1971, George Harrison, fun fact, first ex-Beatle to have a number one song, My Sweet Lord, which, and I know there were some issues with the, with the music, uh, copyright, we're not going to worry about that. The bottom line is that song is the most beautiful inner spiritual anthem I've ever heard. It's a song of bhakti, of devotional spirituality that weaves together um, Hare Krishna and Alleluia in a seamless, integral whole. So the Beatles went to India. Ram Das went to India. Um, by the time I was a teenager, which is around the time of my mystical experience in 1977, I was listening to bands like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and Yes and so forth. Well, there was a band, the band called Yes had an entire album that was based on the teachings of Yogananda. Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And so because I was such a big Yes fan, I had to get that book. And I read that book. And I've never been to India. It's on my bucket list. I've never been. But that book introduced me to India and introduced me to the spiritual tradition of, obviously, of the Hindu tradition. And then from there uh, came Buddhism and Taoism and Shinto and all those other amazing traditions. And, and I'm so conscious of time, so I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet. But let's just say that after reading Yogananda in high school, then came 
Alan Watts, then came Carlos Castaneda, then came Starhawk, the whole kind of pagan conversation. Uh, you know, then came uh, the Sufis, then came the, the Kabbalists, that while I was hopelessly in love with Jesus, I was also just discovering all these other amazing wisdom traditions. And I wish I could say that from day one, I just seamlessly integrated them. But that wouldn't be totally true. I would say from day one, my heart was drawn and connected and intrigued by all of these great traditions. But I struggled. I, I grew up and still live in the South, you know, under the long shadow of, of very conservative theology. And... Um, and certainly imbibed the kind of theological narrative that God is a jealous God and that um, God don't want no competitors. You want to be, you want to be a good Christian. You don't go off and hang out with no Buddhists. You don't go off and hang out with those, those Muslims or those, you know, and so that story was, was in the air as well. So my journey has been a journey of slowly learning to integrate and a lot of that has had to do with my own journey as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. And so I, I think we'll, we'll try to get into a little bit of that tonight. Again, this isn't just about me, but it's, but it's just about, I think that there's some, something zeitgeisty about the world we live in. You know, the Beatles going to India, Ram Dass going to India, Abhishek Tananda, Bede Griffiths, uh, um, Sarah Grant, many others. I'm, maybe after the break, I'll talk about... I especially want to talk about some of the women who have done interfaith work, because the, the guys get all the attention, you know, B. Griffiths, Thomas Merton, yeah, 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 yeah. There have been quite a few women who've been engaged in that work, too, and they they deserve to be to be amplified a little. So, so hopefully we'll get to that. Um, but let me finish by telling just a little story from a few years ago that I think it expresses the hope of where we are today. So my older brother and my sister-in-law live down in Tampa, Florida, and they are absolute agnostics. They, they did not even go to my dad's funeral. They didn't go to my daughter's funeral when my daughter died. They are hardcore agnostics. Um, they are very bemused by the fact that I'm this, you know, full-time Christian lay minister. They don't quite know what to make of it. But they do have this sense of Christianity that I think they get from the media, not from their own experience from the media. So a couple of years ago, I wanted to take a, a seminar at the, well, a weekend event at the Shambhala Center. And the one in Atlanta didn't have that event, but the Shambhala Center in St. Petersburg did. So I registered for it, uh, sent an email to my brother and sister-in-law and said, hey, can I come crash on the couch for a weekend while I'm going to be hanging out with the Buddhists? The very next day, I get a phone call. I'm driving to Gainesville, Georgia, about an hour north of Atlanta, where I'm going to be speaking. Phone rings, answer the phone. It's my brother. And he says, I'm worried about you. And I said, you're worried about me? And he said, yeah, here you are. You have this wonderful kind of ministry as a Christian writer and speaker and teacher. And now you're going to go become a Buddhist? And I said, well, I didn't say I was going to become a Buddhist. I said, I was just going to go to a, a Buddhist conference. And he's like, yeah, but what if the Christians find out? I'm like, Christians aren't going to care if I'm hanging out with the Buddhists, but in his mind, they would. So we talked. I tried to reassure him. We got off the phone. I got to Gainesville at the Episcopal Church where I was speaking, thinking about this conversation. I walk in. Of course, they're having dinner before, before the time for my talk. So I sit down. I'm at a table. I'm with the rector, the priest. I'm with the the senior warden with the director of education who hired me and three or four other people. We're all sitting around. And the topic of conversation was the Dalai Lama's recent visit to Atlanta, and I was the only one at the table who hadn't been there. And I thought, oh, I wish my brother could be right now. And I share that story, not to pick on my brother, I love him dearly, but to point out that the inner spiritual project is already happening in a significant segment of the Christian community. Probably most of the people here have some connection. And we'll, we'll talk about the different flavors of inner spiritual in just a few minutes. So, um, so I want to celebrate that. And back to the meditation, you know, we're in the present, welcoming the future. 
uh, mysticism, and I know some of the wonderful talks this week have really, you know, dug deep into the story of mysticism. In my own writing, I love I love Julian of Norwich. I love Meister Eckhart. I love the Desert Mothers and Fathers, um, Howard Thurman, Simone Weil. You know, all these amazing figures. But that's the story. We are here in the present. We are embodied today. We are welcoming God's future into the present. And my friends, I deeply believe with all my heart that the future that God is offering us will bring the Buddha and Krishna and um, so many other figures from world tradition as surely into the Christian family as Thomas Aquinas brought Aristotle in a thousand years ago. Now, when Thomas Aquinas wrote about Aristotle, his books got burned. We forget that little bit of detail, but they burned his books in Paris. Now, even your most conservative Christian will say, Thomas Aquinas, doctor of the church. If Thomas Aquinas can quote Aristotle and move from being on the fringe to being one of the great teachers of our faith, then I think we can embrace the Buddha and we can embrace the other great wisdom teachers today with that same trust in divine love and in the invitation for our own spiritual life. So inner spirituality is here. I think my story about uh, Grace Episcopal Church in, um, in Gainesville, and fun fact, Stuart Higginbottom is now the priest there. He wasn't the priest at the time, but he is now. Some of you know Stuart, um, wonder, wonderful contemplative teacher himself. But one of the things, I've been involved in the inner spiritual movement in Atlanta for about 10 or 12 years, and, and I've learned a lot about how people relate to inner spirituality. And um, so I'm not going to talk about mysticism just yet. I want to just talk about how Christians engage the other. And let's just look at, at, at five, five ways that I've seen it happen. And the first is to ignore the other. Let's just pretend it's not there. You know, we read the Bible, we worship Jesus, la, 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 la. And what everybody else is doing, we're just going to ignore. I don't think that's very skillful. I don't think it's sustainable at all. Option number two, which unfortunately you see a lot here in the South, is you attack the other. Oh, well, they must, you know, the, the, the demons must be inspiring them. That's why they don't worship Jesus. And it's our job to, um, to convert them. It's our job to give them the truth, to preach the gospel to them. And I understand there is a narrative in Christianity about spreading the gospel. I, I get that. But still, it, it's kind of like this, this gesture of attack. There's some aggression there and some hostility. I don't know that that's skillful, certainly from a contemplative perspective. Option number three is to bargain with the other. Um, you know, yeah, you're not going anywhere, but neither are we. So you stay on your side of the street and we'll stay on our side of the street and we'll just kind of leave each other alone. We'll have a truce. It's really kind of a, a re revisit to number one, isn't it? So it's, you know, so, so again, not, not very skillful. Then it starts getting interesting with the fourth option. That is to befriend the other. You know, like, oh, yeah, maybe we actually need to be talking. Maybe there's something we have in common. Maybe we can build a habitat house together. A lot of interfaith uh, initiatives begin with this befriending the other. Can we just get to know each other? But then number five is when inner faith or inner spiritual movement leads to celebrating the other. Isn't it cool that God has created a world with so much diversity? Isn't it cool that you and I are so different? I am glad we are so different because we can learn from one another and we can show each other how we engage with the miracle of this life that we find ourselves in. So, Clearly, when we talk about mystical spirituality, both deep within Christianity and broad within other traditions, we're talking about options number four and number five. And I hope wherever you are in that spectrum, I hope you'll consider how can the spirit maybe tug you a little bit closer to those places of befriending and celebration. So... Um, so mysticism and Christianity don't always have the happiest of relationships either. That is something I have learned having written a couple of books on, on mysticism and Christianity. And so I want to share with you some perspectives that I have seen um, within Christianity and mysticism. And again, it's very similar to Christianity and other faiths. 
ignore it, attack it, bargain with it, befriend it, celebrate it. But then as soon as you start talking about Christian mysticism, guess what happens? The Buddhists show up, the Kabbalists show up, the Sufis show up, the Vedantists show up, the Taoists show up. And it's like, wow, these people are speaking a language that I resonate with so deeply, but we don't worship the same way. We don't have the same rituals or sacraments. We don't read the same sacred texts. What do we do now? So if you look at the larger community out there, the inner spiritual community, and probably many of us here tonight are plugged into that community. Maybe you're more plugged into that community than you are to the Christian community. But I've noticed some interesting dynamics over the years, and I wanted to share those with you real quick. In some conservative Christian circles, especially conservative Catholic circles, I don't see this as much in the evangelical world, because in my experience, conservative evangelicals are suspicious of mysticism. But conservative Catholics will tell you the only good mystic is a Christian mystic. It's okay to be a mystic as long as you're only reading, you know, official doctors of the church, St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, even Meister Eckhart is a little suspect. So uh, mysticism is okay as long as it's our mysticism, but we can't intermingle it with other faiths. I think we can see how that how that's back to those early, early postures of, of how we relate to other faiths. Maybe not the most skillful approach. Meanwhile, what I've seen a lot of times in the inner spiritual world is every religion is welcome, but Christianity need not apply. Every religion is welcome, but Christianity need not apply. That sometimes in inner spiritual spaces, the Christians are treated like the redheaded stepchildren. No offense to redheads. Um, and I think that's a reaction to the to the 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 um, enclosed nature of too much conservative Christian thinking. If Christians are going to be dismissive of other of other traditions, then the other traditions return the favor. So I think those of us who really want deep Christian spirituality and deep engagement with other traditions, sometimes we have double biases to overcome. Um, it's like it's like many queer Christians find that you know Christians, many Christians don't want to welcome queer people into their churches, um, and then people in the queer community are like, "Are you nuts for going to church?" So it's like again, there are boundaries on both sides. Um, the third option, which I think is a beautiful option, it's not my option, but I think it's a beautiful option. This is where every path is truly welcome, Christianity and all other paths. Um, and so the bias against any one faith like Christianity drops away, and there truly is a generosity of welcoming everything. The challenge I have with that is that it can lead to kind of a... Um, being a re uber relativistic. I'm not opposed to relativism. I know sometimes that's a dirty word. I don't think it's a dirty word, but I think relativism, an unmoored relativism can lead to kind of a sense of being adrift. So the option that I have chosen and, I, and may resonate with you, but you might like one of these others, is to have a home path while keeping your arms wide open. So it's almost this kind of a gesture. And so for me, clearly Christianity is my home path. That, that love affair that began in 1977 is still going strong. Um, and I regularly sit with a Sangha here in Atlanta. I, um, you know, I, I was just in Rochester, Minnesota, leading a retreat for a group of San Franciscan nuns. And one of the nuns introduced, introduced me to a man from Korea who's a fellow at the Mayo, at the Mayo Clinic who, who brought this amazing meditation uh, tradition from Korea over to North America. And immediately I'm ordering books and reading all that I can about, you know, because that's who I am. Deep love for Jesus, home faith, deep embrace of the other worlds. So that's the spirit that I hope we can, we can play with tonight. Okay, so in that, let's open that door. So to have a home, a home deep Christian mystical spirituality, but that interest in, in the other, it seems to me there are five ways we can do inner spirituality as mystical Christians or contemplative Christians. And again, I, I offer these to you absolutely 
with with uh, a recognition of the beauty of all of the above. So I invite these to you to listen where you might fall on the continuum, not because this one's better than that one, but that they represent, as it were, different paths up the mountain. And I use the metaphor of two different nations and how people can interact with two different nations. So the first type of inner spirituality I would call tourist inner spirituality. And this is, again, anchored in one faith, but interested in one or more other faiths. And how I see this playing out is I like to read. You know, I'm a Christian, but I love to read the Dalai Lama. I'm a Christian, but I love to read Thich Nhat Hanh. I'm a Christian, but I have a couple of books by Starhawk. You know, and and it maybe it, nowadays that also extends to some social media interaction or or you know material online, but there's there's this and and maybe even going to hear a talk. Oh yeah, the Dalai Lama speaking at at Emory University. I'm there. You know, but it's still primarily anchored in Christianity. You go for a little trip and then you come home. It's tourist inner spirituality. The second is expatriate interspirituality. And I, I have a number of friends who have done this. And expatriate interspirituality is, I think, your home faith, there's a rupture there. You're, you're angry, you've been hurt, you've been wounded, there's some trauma, or you've just been bored to tears. I mean, everybody's story is a little different. One of my dearest friends was the, the guiding teacher of a Buddha Sangha here, here in town. He's retired now, raised Catholic, you know, and, and had no ill will to Catholicism. But when he discovered Buddhism, he was done with the Catholic Church. And I would ask him, well, what do you think about Jesus? And he's, you know, kind of starts singing the Doobie Brothers. Jesus is just all right. With, you know, and that was kind of his attitude. Jesus was all right. But he was an expatriate. He had moved from Christianity to Buddhism. Option number three is, is immigrant interspirituality. And this is like the tourist only, only in reverse. So, um, so there's, there's this movement and this change maybe even in identity, but there might still be the trips back home, the trips back home to see mom and dad. I, I think a lot of people do this, you know, when it's like, I'm Wiccan, but when I go home, I go to mass with my mom to make her happy. You know, boy, I've heard that a lot of times over the years. So that's kind of the immigrant inner spirituality, a little bit different than the expatriate, because the expatriate is angry at the home faith. The immigrant is like, yeah, it's just not me anymore. Number four is ambassador inner spirituality. And this is, again, going deep, but really trying to establish deeper ties with both. So like if you're an ambassador, you know, let's say, you know, you're a diplomat, you become the ambassador to France or the ambassador to, to South Africa or whatever. You move there, you live there, you build relationships there, you dive deep, and you still are a citizen of the home, the home base. You still go home for vacations. Eventually you will return home to retire, that kind of thing. And then finally, the fifth. The fifth model of inner spirituality is dual citizen inner spirituality. And this is where truly the boundaries begin to fall away. And it's like mm, six, six months in Buddhism, six months in Christianity, or you know, kind of the, you know, what I'll do, you know, go to Sangha in the morning and go to Mass at night, that kind of thing. Where there is, and and if you want to get into the nuts and bolts. Take Buddhism, for example. You take refuge. You take the precepts. You become a Buddhist, but you don't renounce your baptism. You go deep with both. It can be messy. It can be difficult, but it can also be heart opening. So my point in, in, in uh, sharing all of these is that I think there's no one right way to do inner spirituality when you're anchored within Christianity. There, are, there is a menu of possibilities. And, and the invitation here is to find what makes our hearts sing and to, um, to go there and to do that. Was it that Howard, Howard Thurman famously said, you know, uh, don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs is people who are alive. So ask what makes your heart sing in terms of your spiritual journey and go do that. 
So I want to, before we, we, we do our next meditation, I do want to circle back to some, you know, to, to, well, even to my, my brother and sister-in-law, but also to Christians I have known, and maybe you know as well, because I don't think the South has a monopoly on, on these kinds of Christians, people who love God, who love the Christian tradition, love scripture, love church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're just deeply uncomfortable with inner spiritual work. It either frightens them, it scares them, it just makes them feel icky, it makes them nervous. It, there are a variety of responses. Uh, for years, that just befuddled me because, again, from the time I was in high school, I just was interested in it all. And what I eventually, I think it was becoming a spiritual director that really helped me, and of course, doing my own, my own work as a directee, that I came to realize that that there is a theology beneath that, and beneath that theology is an image of God. And so I think that anybody who is interested in doing inner spiritual work as a Christian needs to spend some time, some deep time, reflecting on and possibly shaping and reshaping one's image of God. And so let me just, just offer some thoughts. Um, our image of God shapes our story. It shapes our story of faith. It shapes our story of practice. It shapes how we relate to church, how we relate to the tradition, how we relate to scripture, how we relate to one another. It really all goes back to image of God. I think image of God is more important than theology. Everybody talks about theology. But if, if your theology isn't built on a solid image of God, you're just going to have whacked theology. That's a, that's a technical theological term, whacked theology. Um, so I don't know about you. Again, my story, I got a lot of ideas about who God was when I was very little, and I carried them with me for a long, long time. And a lot of the images that I carried with me, you can find in scripture, you can find in the Bible, you can certainly, you can find in the saints, you can find in the mystics. I don't know that they are the most skillful images of God. I think Richard Rohr is famous talking about scripture. You know, the scripture is three steps forward and two steps back as human beings have tried to learn what it means to worship a God of love. And so, in other words, there are, sometimes scripture teaches by bad example. Now, I'm not saying it isn't the word of God. Okay, I don't want to scandalize anybody, but sometimes it teaches by bad example. And yet the reality is, is we take those bad examples and then we carry them with us. And so just two examples. Uh, number one, that God is a guy, you know, that to just just narrowing the, the gender understanding of God, that God is male. Um, you know, I it's not only gender, it's sexuality. So you're getting to some pretty weird stuff there. But it clearly is a diminishing, uh, not only of, you know of women, of, of, you know, women, whether we're talking about sexuality or we're talking about gender or both, but also uh, so much of the queer community. There, and then even within the masculine community or the, or the male community, what does a narrow image of the male God have to say about what it means to be male? So, so that's the first problem that I carried with me for many, many years. The second problem was the idea of God as a God of anger and judgment. And, and incidentally, a little aside, the best antidote to that is Julian of Norwich. So if you're struggling with an angry image of God, please read Julian of Norwich. But, um, but in the meantime, you know, this is the God that is just waiting to send us to hell. This is the God that just absolutely hates the tiniest sin. I mean, even using the word hate in relationship with this God. So. Um, the problem is we carry these as unexamined assumptions, and then they torpedo our efforts, our efforts to embody compassion, our efforts to be in relationship with other faith traditions. So let me just offer a few questions. Um, if you were to describe God to a friend or family member, what would you say? How would you describe God's personality? What is your understanding of concepts like love, justice, righteousness, holiness, and compassion? And how do you experience those things 
in terms of your relationship with God? Do you even see God as someone or something to be in relationship with? Do you watch God the way a mouse watches the cat? Does the phrase intimacy with God mean anything to you? Does that fill you with joy and excitement or maybe with an undefinable dread? If you've experienced religious trauma or religious abuse, how does that then factor with the way you image God today? And could healing your image of God be an important component to healing your experience of trauma and abuse? Obviously, we could spend the rest of our time together tonight just talking about image of God. It is such an important topic. And I think anybody who truly wants to dive deep into mystical Christianity, because um, like it or not, Christianity is a theistic tradition. Now, I, you know, my go-to, obviously, God is love, but also God is mystery. But even those are images, aren't they? You know, as soon as we use language, as soon as we tell a story, we are trucking with images. And so an important part of the mystical practice mystical life is not only being on the cushion, not only diving deep into silence, but also wrestling with the story that informs our image. The next thing I would say is that our dear friend, the Greeks, gave us the idea that God is static. And so um, is your image of God dynamic? Is, does your image of God grow? Does it breathe? Does it change? Does it unfold? Does it blossom? Does it surprise you? Does the surprise God? Um, can we move into, you know, and I think the technical term here is what process theology. Can we move into divinity as process? And what impact then could that have for us as we seek to welcome the divine future into our lives? So if you're carrying subconsciously a judgmental image of God, is it possible? To, um, to invite the Spirit into a process of healing that image of God, which is really to say healing your own heart, so that you are more available to receive infinite love from the divine. And finally, you know, obviously, I'm just giving this, what, five minutes. Um, if this is something that is truly a thorny, thorny issue for you, I would encourage you to work with a spiritual director or possibly a therapist, and that um, that sometimes the tied up knot of a difficult or toxic image of God, we cannot untie by ourselves. And, and to, to be forgiving of that and gentle with that, but then also to seek the kind of support that can, that can create the space in your heart for the infinite love that then makes it possible to dive deep and embrace others. Um, I realized during the silence, there's, there's so much. I've, I've just barely begun to scratch the surface. You know, two hours is hardly enough time to do this topic justice. And um, and I've tried to avoid, you know, getting caught up in 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 the details, because inner spirituality is such a vast topic, but to, um, to really offer this invitation that if we enter into the mystery, here, here's the way I look at it. There are so many languages, and there's one silence. There are so many cultures and there's one silence. There are so many mythologies, and there's one silence. There are so many theologies, and there's one silence. And so to embrace the adventure of mystical Christianity, and I know, you know, this is the end of a week with many amazing gifted teachers offering different doorways into the mystery. Eventually, those paths lead us into the silence. And in the silence, we find that place where we are one. 
But that doesn't take away the differences in culture or the differences in theology or spirituality or mythology or ritual, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't take away the tensions or the conflicts. I don't want to paint too rosy a picture about inner spirituality. There are real tensions if you just try to dig deep on that cognitive level, that level of doctrine or teaching. Uh, to me, that's like a Cohen. It's like a Cohen writ large, you know? Um, you don't solve Cohen's so much as you just enter into them. And, and so I guess my hope is, is that anyone who is really serious about doing the work of contemplative practice as a Christian is sooner or later going to find all these invitations which we are free to accept or to set aside. And anyone who is truly doing their work of deep practice from another, another tradition, entering into that silence, will find the potential for deep resonance with mystical Christianity. And I, for one, just believe that the Holy Spirit is inviting us into this, this sacred place. But we're pioneers, and because we're pioneers, our stories will look different, our paths will look different. Some of us will have joyful experiences, others may have more fraught experiences, but it's all part of the larger, the larger symphony, the larger tapestry. So before we open up to conversation, I do just want to mention five names. I, I mentioned earlier, when I was thinking about who are some of the exemplars for mystical interspiritual Christians. And, and again, you know, the usual names, you know, Thomas Merton, Bede Griffiths, um, you know, they they crop up, uh, Abhishek Tananda. And and hey, I love those folks. But there are a number of, of wonderful women who really deserve our attention to. So I just want to mention five, and this is not an exhaustive list, but five that I have found really helpful. And so if you're not familiar with, with, with these amazing Christian, mystical, interspiritual women, then here's an invitation for you. And the first one is Sarah Grant, who lived from 1922 to 2002. She's an English, uh, she was Scottish, born in England, Catholic, became a nun, the Sacred Heart nun, went to India in 1956. So she knew Abhishek Tananda, she knew B. Griffiths, she, she met Ramana Maharshi, uh, and basically, her her Christianity became shaped by non-dual thinking, non-dual philosophy. She was a philosopher, and so she wrote a book called Toward an Alternative Theology, Confessions of a Non-Dualist Christian. So, second person I want to mention is Beatrice Bruteau, who just died a few years ago, 1930 to 2014. She... Um, also a philosopher, one of the first women to get a PhD in philosophy from Fordham University back in the 50s. So, and her field was the philosophy of interreligious dialogue with uh, a particular focus on Buddhism and Vedanta. Uh, Cynthia Bergeau called her one of the most powerful shaping influences on contemporary mystical theology, inner spirituality, and contemporary practice. Author of 12 books, including Radical Optimism, God's Ecstasy, and what we can learn from the East. Then Elaine uh, McInnes, or McKines, I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced, also um, has passed away just last year, 1924 to 2022, lived well into her, her 90s. Canadian nun, member of Our Ladies of Missionaries, was the first Canadian of all, any gender to be authorized as a Zen teacher. Uh, she was a disciple of Kun Yamada Roshi, who also uh, taught um, Ruben Habito, among other Zen Christians. She was respected as a Zen teacher both in North America and Japan. Wrote a number of books, including Zen Contemplation for Christians, Light Sitting in Light, A Christian's Experience of Zen, and The Flowing Bridge, Guidance on Beginning Zen Koans. Then two, two people who are still alive, Jan Willis, um, born in 1948, a professor of religion at Wesleyan University from Alabama. Her father was a Baptist deacon and a steel worker in Alabama. Yes, Alabama had steel workers. 
Um, she traveled in Asia in the early 1970s, became a student of Thubten Yeshe, so became a Tibetan Buddhist, wrote several books on Tibetan Buddhism, including The Diamond Light of the Eastern Dawn, An Introduction to Tibetan Buddhist Meditation. She also published her own memoir called Dreaming Me, Black, Baptist, and Buddhist, One Woman's Spiritual Journey. And finally, um, Susan Stabile, born in 1957, Catholic laywoman, a lawyer, and a law professor, and a spiritual director, but she spent 20 years practicing Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, and was ordained a Tibetan Buddhist nun. She eventually opted to leave the, the uh, religious life and the, the life of a Buddhist nun, got married, returned to Christian practice, and so she now is an Ignatian-trained spiritual director. She wrote a wonderful book called Growing in Love and Wisdom, Tibetan Buddhist Sources for Christian Meditation. So um, obviously there are many, many other voices, but I, I really wanted to highlight those five because I think they're wonderful and um, yeah, that you might too. Carl, boy, thank you. How can we thank you enough? This has just been so wonderful. I wish we had at least another hour, um, uh, really. I, I, I hope everybody can join me in a big, warm, heartfelt round of applause for Carl by waving your hands as we've been doing. Carl, you're awesome. <laughs> You've really enriched us and we thank you for this.